everyone. I am Melinda Brianna Epler, founder and CEO of Change Catalyst and author of How to Be an Ally. I'm your host of Leading with Empathy and Allyship. Welcome. Allyship is about learning, showing empathy, and taking action. That process often includes learning, unlearning, and relearning, then building empathy for people with different experiences, and above all, taking consistent action. So each week, we'll learn from somebody new. Please be open to new ways of thinking and understanding. You can learn more about my work and sign up to join us for a live recording at ally.cc. Let's get started. Today, we are speaking with David Glasgow, who is the executive director of the New York University Meltzer Center for Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging, and the co-author of Say the Right Thing, How to Talk About Identity, Diversity, and Justice. And today, we'll be discussing how to have inclusive conversations about identity in the workplace. For those of you on YouTube, uh, we'll describe ourselves for anybody who is blind or low vision. So I am a white woman. I have long blonde and red hair. I'm wearing black and white glasses. I have a black long sleeve shirt on. David? Uh, well, thank you so much for having me, uh, Melinda. And my name is David Glasgow. I'm a white man with uh, graying hair and glasses and a checkered shirt. Excellent. Glad to have you here on the show. And um, our interpreters today, our ASL interpreters today, are Christina and Kaylee from Interpreter Now. And you can learn more about them at www.interpreter-now.com. Well, welcome, David. I'm glad to have you here um, with us having this discussion. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So will you start by telling us a bit about your own story and how you came to do the work that you do around diversity, inclusion, and belonging? Absolutely. So my background professionally is actually as a lawyer. Um, and so I practiced in my home country, Australia, in uh, employment and anti-discrimination law. Uh, but uh, legal practice wasn't really for me. And I was always much more interested in the kind of values driving anti-discrimination law. So I was always kind of very passionate about social justice, equality, inclusion, all of the kinds of values that lead to civil rights and anti-discrimination laws in the first place. And so when I came to the United States and I did a master's program, I studied under uh, my co-author, actually, Kenji Yoshino, um, in the program at NYU Law. And I got introduced to work that he was doing in this field of diversity, equity, and inclusion in that program, and immediately fell in love with this field of diversity, equity, and inclusion for both professional and personal reasons. So I'm a gay man myself, and uh, growing up uh, in a household, in, a, in an evangelical household where I uh, felt a kind of lack of belonging, I would say, through a lot of my formative years. And so that really drove me to be interested in what makes for inclusive cultures, what makes for a society where everyone feels like they can truly belong, because I felt that lack of belonging myself. And then, as I said, professionally, I also wanted to kind of pivot away from the law to think more deeply about how to create inclusive cultures and inclusive societies outside of the, the structures imposed by the law. And this area just seemed like such a great fit for both my kind of personal and professional interests. Excellent. So what brought you specifically to write the book? Um, what led you there? So Kenji and I uh, worked together for many years uh, with organizations outside of the law school and also with uh, students and, and administrators and faculty within the law school on diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. And we kept encountering a barrier in our work, which is a lot of people who want to be good allies and want to participate in diversity and inclusion efforts were terrified of saying the wrong thing. And so often they would withdraw in fear. Um, and so we didn't like that because we felt that there's a whole pool of people who really should be part of these conversations within their respective organizations. And so we wanted to uh, give people some practical tools for overcoming that fear of saying the wrong thing. And hence the title of the book, Say the Right Thing, which is <laughs> that we wanted to just write a very... Uh, practical kind of toolkit for people for how to navigate conversations about the full range of identity issues that they might encounter, whether it's in the workplace or beyond. 
And whether it's about, you know, race issues, gender, LGBTQ issues, disability, socioeconomic status, really the whole spectrum. And and that's what led us to this work is that we really wanted to help allies uh, get better in a domain in which they're currently experiencing a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds very familiar. I wrote my book, How to Be an Ally, because I saw so many people that were afraid to do the wrong thing or or just didn't know what to do. And so um, that's that's, that's right. fantastic. Um, so um, maybe we could talk a bit first about what does it mean to have it? What, it, what kind of identity conversations are you, are you talking about um, here in the book? Uh, what does an identity conversation look like? What does an inclusive conversation look like? Yeah, we define identity conversations really broadly as, you know, any conversation that's about the kind of important social identities that make us who we are. So any of mm. the kind of themes that I was saying before around, you know, race, gender, LGBTQ issues, et cetera. But just to make that more concrete, you know, in the workplace, um, you know, there's a lot of conversations happening in workplaces these days around issues of bias, of privilege, of allyship, any conversation about diversifying the the workplace or any conversation mm -hmm. around whether people feel included or not, whether people feel a sense of belonging in the workplace or not, all of those cluster of conversations we define as identity conversations. Also, anything that's in the public arena, you know, you only have to look at a newspaper, click on a headline, and you'll see there's constant identity conversations happening in the media around controversies like critical race theory, so-called, or right. around yeah. a lot of the debates around LGBTQ issues. Um, so all of that as well, we define as identity conversations. And of course, it's not just the media having these conversations, but it's all of us in our, you know, family barbecues or around the dinner table with, with colleagues, conversations happening in school. So, you know, these conversations are happening younger and younger, of course, right, with people even in, you know, elementary school or preschool now getting exposed to ideas of diversity and inclusion. So any conversations mm -hmm. around whether or not classrooms are LGBTQ inclusive or any conversations about, you know, accommodations for students with disabilities or any of that we also would define as an identity conversation. So I hope you get the sense from that, that yeah, we've, we've really tried to tackle a universe of conversations that's really quite big uh, in this book. Yeah, yeah. And I would say that maybe uh, you, you kind of touched on it, but but explicitly calling out that uh, that for a lot of leaders and managers, people leaders working with their teams, having a conversation is about what's going on um, in the world that might affect um, people with different identities and their on their teams, um, whether that's anti-trans legislation or that is um, injustice and police brutality against Black, Asian, um, Native, and Indigenous people, and so on, as um, and and more and much more. Um, so I. I suspect all that is included as well. Yeah. Exactly. And and yeah. the specific lens that we bring to this is really focusing on the ally side of the conversation. So, you know, we didn't want to write a book for, you know, members of marginalized groups on, you know, what they can do to, you know, stand up for themselves and advocate mm -hmm. for themselves. We really wanted to write a book for people who are entering these conversations from a higher power position. So that might be an organizational power position, like a manager or a teacher or a professor or what have you, but it could also be entering from a higher power position because of your social identity. So I, as a man entering conversations about gender or as a white person entering conversations about race, mm -hmm. we really wanted to write a book intended for that audience. And of course, because all of us have some baskets of advantage and disadvantage in our lives, all of us have the opportunity in some of these conversations to enter as an ally. Yeah. So we work with a lot of clients and leaders who are struggling to have those identity conversations due to that fear of saying or doing the wrong thing. And also because the work environments like environments across the U.S. have become more polarized in a lot of ways. And so, you know, within our workplaces, there are oppo opponents of diversity, equity, and inclusion that have already always been there. But lately, they, you know, they're more empowered and more vocal. And, and as yeah. a result, 
Um, I think a lot of leaders are struggling with, well, do I have the conversation because I'm going to get this pushback? What does that look like to have that conversation? How do I enroll everybody in being a part of it? And and so I, I know you you in your book, you discuss how you have some recommendations for how leaders have those inclusive conversations about the identity with your teams. What are what are some ways to get started? Yeah, it's a great question because, as you say, it is becoming uh, much more polarized and politicized right now. So one of the, um, you know, we we structure the book around kind of seven principles for how to have these conversations effectively. And so happy to kind of go down any any path that's of most interest to you. But for as a starting point, um, what we encourage readers to do is think about what mistakes they might currently be making in these conversations. And so we categorize those as avoid, deflect, deny, and attack. So we shorten that to mm. ADDA. And, you know, in describing what various forms that those can take, uh, I think every reader, including certainly me and my co-author Kenji, we should, will recognize some of the behaviors that they themselves can slip into sometimes. And personally, avoidance is a big one for me. Right. You know, I think a lot of leaders are in that position as well of struggling with the idea that, oh, well, maybe it's just easier if I say nothing, you know, if I just don't talk about this at all. That, we argue in the book, is increasingly not the safest option for people because um, silence is being called out a lot more these days as not as, you know, staying neutral, but actually being complicit with injustice. If something, Mm -hmm. you know, we give the example of the Black Lives Matter movement and we cite a senior corporate leader at that time who said that he was struggling with whether or not he ought to have a conversation about this, you know, heated topic in the workplace when a lot of people felt like, you know, this doesn't really belong in the workplace. Why are we talking about this at all? But he ultimately concluded that it was really important for him to say something about, you know, what was going on because there isn't this strict boundary between the outside world and the workplace. Um, and so, you know, we really encourage people in the book to lean against that instinct to engage in avoidance, right? All of us have that instinct. And I think kind of trying to push firmly against it is really important. But there are certain skills that you have to cultivate to be able to do that, because often avoidance comes from deep discomfort that we feel. We are, as I said, mm-hmm. terrified that we'll say the wrong thing, or we're scared of of getting cancelled or we're scared of hurting someone that we care about. And so we have a couple of chapters after that talking about the really important skills of resilience and curiosity. And I think those two are what I would recommend as a starting point for leaders to think about how do I overcome my tendency to engage in avoidance or deflection or denial and attack? And it's to build those qualities of resilience and curiosity so that I can engage in these conversations without shutting down. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, let's take those two then. Um, First, around curiosity, what does that look like to really, really engage people with curiosity? So we point out in the book that often when we're entering these conversations as allies, uh, there's a lot of information that we don't know. Um, So just to take as an example of someone, I I don't have a disability, but let's say I'm having a conversation with a wheelchair user about disability issues. Now that person I'm speaking with is going to know a lot more about disability issues than I am likely to know entering that conversation. For example, I can go about my life without being aware of where the curb cuts and ramps are in my neighborhood or, you know, which areas are easy or difficult to navigate or what kinds of biases and barriers uh, people with disabilities encounter as they go about their life or what kinds of assumptions and expectations non-disabled people apply to people with disabilities. My conversation partner is going to know a lot of that information. I'm not going to know a lot of that information. And so it's extremely important then that I enter the conversation from a place of humility, recognizing Mm. that there is a lot that I need to learn and I shouldn't be charging in and insisting that I hold the truth in that conversation because often there's a lot of truth that the other person holds rather than me. But we also point out that sometimes in these conversations, there's information where we don't even know that we don't know it. So one of the mistakes people make in these conversations is to think that they know all that there is to know 
even when there's a whole universe of information they don't. And so, for example, let's say on trans issues. Now, I might know that there's a difference between the terms transgender, non-binary, gender queer, gender fluid, agender, but maybe I don't know exactly what the difference is between those five terms, but I could use Google and find out the answer to that. And so it's a form of ignorance where I know that I don't know. But there are also forms of ignorance where perhaps I don't even, I'm not even aware of my lack of knowledge. So let's say I think that I know what it means to be transgender, but I don't realize that you can be trans even if you haven't undergone gender confirmation surgery or you ha- you're not taking hormones and you can still be trans. So that's an area where I might not even be aware of my own ignorance. And so the advice we give in situations like that, again, it's that posture of radical humility that you enter these conversations with that's extremely important. And so what mm-hmm. we want people to do is to listen generously and share tentatively. Often we do the opposite of that. Often we share our own perspective very openly and want everyone to hear what we think. And then when it comes to listening time, we just sort of half pay attention to what the person is saying and prepare our own response to to what, what we're hearing. We want people to flip that a little bit. And so focus very much on listening generously to the perspective of the other person so that you're recognizing that they're bringing information to the table that you might not have. And then also share your own perspective tentatively. So flip statements into like definitive statements into I statements. So instead of saying something, let's say I'm having a conversation with you, Melinda, we're talking about gender issues. I might say, oh, don't make this about gender. This isn't about gender. Now, Mm. That's not a very curious way of engaging in the conversation. Another way that we would recommend flipping that would be, let's say I don't think that what we're talking about is gender related. The way I would communicate that would be to say something like, you know, I'm having difficulty seeing the gender dimensions of this issue. What am I missing? Can you tell me, you know, what you're seeing in this conversation? So again, I'm I'm still sharing my perspective, but I'm doing it in a way that is not definitive and is leaving space for the possibility that I might be wrong and inviting your perspective into the conversation. Mm, And so there's some humility, vulnerability in there as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Um, And you write about shame and fear, and uh, I think guilt is in there as well, um, which I talk about a lot in my work too. And I I wonder if you could share some of your thoughts about how shame and fear play a role in conversations about identity and how we can check those emotions. Absolutely. And so a lot of the fear comes from, you know, the the wonderful social psychologist Dolly Chug in her book, The Person You Mean to Be, talks about how when we have conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we often get stuck in a fixed mindset. So I'm sure many of your listeners are aware of the basic distinction between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. This is from the psychologist Carol Dweck's work where a fixed mindset is, you know, I assume that if I'm not good at something that it's because I'm innately bad at it and I can't get better with effort, right? If I'm not good at it, I may as well give up. Whereas a growth mindset is the idea that if I apply effort to something I can learn and grow. And um, so I don't see mistakes as reflections of my innate deficiencies as a human being. Mm -hmm. Now, Dolly Chug points out that in this arena, even if we normally apply a growth mindset to other areas of our life, like learning a musical instrument or learning a language, when it comes to these conversations, we often get stuck in a fixed mindset because it seems like the consequences of getting it wrong are quite catastrophic, right? It's not just I've made a mistake, it's I'm a racist, I'm a sexist, I'm a homophobe, Mm. I'm a transphobe. And so the mistake comes to define us as human beings. And that's where I think a lot of this fear is coming from. And so, you know, one of the things that we encourage people to do is to focus on trying to carry over that growth mindset from other areas of your life into this arena as well. So, you know, if you're thinking, if you've got self-talk, like, I just am not good at pronouns. I I don't understand pronouns. I'm not good at that. That's a very fixed mindset kind of self-talk. Whereas just by adding the word yet to the end of that and saying, you know, I'm not good at pronouns yet, 
yeah. but I can learn them is kind of a more of a growth mindset oriented way of thinking about that issue. And another sort of strategy that we, you know, encourage people to do is to name and reframe their emotions. So guilt, you mentioned guilt. That's one of four primary emotions that we talk about in the book that people feel when they're having these conversations. So let's say I confuse two people who belong to the same racial or ethnic group with each other. I call them each other's names, which is something that happens a lot. Sometimes, you know, if you make a mistake like that, uh, you could feel incredibly guilty about it. Like I'm, you know, I'm a horrible person. Am I racist? Why did I do something? Why did I make that kind of mistake? What we encourage people to do is notice the emotion that they're feeling. Sometimes we're so incredibly uncomfortable that we fail to actually stop and pause and think, am I feeling fear, anger, guilt, hopelessness? What is the specific emotion that I'm feeling? And then is there a way that I might be able to reframe this experience, emotional experience in a more growth mindset oriented way? So in the case of confusing two people with each other, a more, uh, the fixed mindset thought would be, I'm a terrible person for doing this. The growth mindset way would be to reflect on that and say, I, everyone makes mistakes. I will apologize learn their names and do better next time. Again, mm -hmm. it's still taking accountability for the mistake that you made, that you sort of did something wrong, but it's it's using the opportunity to learn from the mistake by seeing it in that more growth mindset frame. Fantastic. Yeah. I was thinking that in in episode 84 with Nisha Anand, we talked about the importance of finding common ground. Often we have conversations with people and we can feel that we're so polarized that there's nothing there's nothing in between where we have that common ground and and so in in that in that episode we talked about we explored what it looked like to use our curiosity to find areas where we do agree um even when we think we're on opposing sides of the issue there's often some common ground and at the same time i think it's really important too to note that we don't always have to agree either. And, and there are going to be points where we disagree. And, and I think one of the key chapters in your book talks about disagreeing respectfully. So what does that look like? Can you share a bit about what that looks like? Absolutely. Uh, so yes, I agree with you. We need to look for that common ground. And we talk about that in that chapter, the importance of particularly trying to find what we call uncommon commonalities. So when you're disagreeing with someone, Sometimes people try to find some very surface level commonality that they might have with the other person, and it doesn't really help to build that bond. Whereas if you look for areas where there's a deeper commonality or something that the other person might not be expecting that you would agree with them on, that can help the disagreement go more smoothly. So if we're having mm -hmm. a disagreement over some DEI policy in the workplace, you might think that I oppose all diversity and inclusion efforts. And so you might immediately be have your guard up of like, oh no, I'm engaging with this, with this person who believes in all the backlash. Whereas what if I just have some, you know, smaller issue with the way that the policy has been framed? And I can kind of put your mind at ease a bit by telling you about all of the diversity inclusion initiatives that I do agree with. So again, that's the common ground that you're describing. Mm -hmm. One of the tools that we talk about in the chapter when you are stuck with a disagreement, like a real disagreement where you can't just uh, focus only on the commonalities is what we call the controversy scale. So if you imagine a scale that's drawn from, from left to right, not political left to right, but just uh, left to right. And on the left of the scale are the subjects that are easiest to have disagreements over. So we we on the far left, we have tastes. So if you and I are disagreeing over what flavor of ice cream we like or what Netflix shows we like, that's a very easy disagreement to have. We're probably not going to be deeply mm. uncomfortable with it. But as you move over on the scale, the next point on the scale are disagreements over facts. So uh, here we're thinking purely journalistic facts. So who, what, when, how kind of facts. Um, then the next one that becomes harder still is when you disagree about policies and then again, it gets harder if you disagree about values. And then over on the far right end of the scale is when you disagree over someone's equal humanity, right? Those are obviously mm -hmm. extremely difficult disagreements to navigate. Yeah. And so one of the biggest problems in this arena that we notice is that 
allies are often at a very different point on that controversy scale than the person that they're speaking to. So if I'm Mm. talking with, say, a parent at my kid's school about the diversity and inclusion curriculum at the school, I might think that I'm just having a conversation about policy. Whereas if I'm speaking to, let's say, someone who has a child of colour at the school, right, they might see that conversation as about their equal humanity. Like, do I and does my child even belong in this school? And so they hear my disagreement on that subject as implicating their equal humanity. And so it's very, very important when having these disagreements to recognize that where you are on the scale might be very different to where your conversation partner is on the scale and look for opportunities to just make that simple acknowledgement. You don't necessarily need to move over to the scale and see the issue exactly the same way that the other person sees the issue, but you can show the other person that you recognize that. You can say to them, look, you know, to me, this is an issue of policy that we're talking about. I see that for you, this this may have much deeper implications and I want to do my best to honor and respect that while we're having this conversation. And you tell me if I am not doing that in this conversation and we can recalibrate. I think just even a simple acknowledgement like that, it's not going to make the conversation go magically better just by doing that. But I do think it shows that you've built in some empathy in the conversation where they realize that you you see them for, for how this issue might be affecting them personally. Yeah, Absolutely. Let's let's talk about privilege um, too. I, I know. That, speaking of devices, <laughs> uh, speaking of ways that sometimes um, we can it, words that can feel polarizing. I know that privilege is one. It can cause. It can produce all kinds of emotions in people. I, I've mm-hmm. seen a lot of avoidance, a lot of deflection, a lot of denial and attacks when this concept comes up. Right. Yes. How would you suggest we think of privilege differently when we're having inclusive conversations? Yeah. So, you know, we're certainly not the first um, people to make this point, but often um, when people hear privilege, I think what they interpret that to mean is a suggestion that their life has been easy um, or that they've sort of never encountered any hardship in their life or they've never worked hard for anything that they've achieved in their life. And, you know, often that's not the way that people using the term actually intend for it to be used. So we we tend to think of it much more as a kind of multi-dimensional um, factor where everyone has, as I mentioned at the outset, you know, baskets of advantage and disadvantage. And so, yeah. you know, it may, you know, I have privilege as a man, I have privilege as a white person, you know, I lack privilege on the grounds of sexual orientation. So there are, and I think if everyone kind of goes through the exercise of thinking about the different parts of their identity, they're going to find that there are some areas where they do have privilege or, or advantage um, relative to other folks and then where they may lack that privilege or advantage in other ways. And so I think thinking about it in that multidimensional way can sort of help bring people's guards down a little bit. I also think just recognizing that it doesn't mean, you know, you didn't work hard or that you've never encountered any hardship in your life. You know, I think it's really, again, you know, Dolly Chug and, and, and various others have likened privilege to experiencing a tailwind on a flight. It's something that you Um, have kind of giving you an invisible boost as you move along through life. But it doesn't mean that the plane flies all on its own and there's no pilot and no one's ever actually done any work to to fly the plane. It just means that you're getting, you know, that extra boost as you go along. And so I think Mm. um, it's just important for people to really stop and, and question whether or not the interpretation that they're applying to the word privilege is what the other person means when they're using the term. And again, I think this goes back to curiosity, right? If someone uses the term privilege in a conversation with you and you automatically find those defenses going up and you find yourself deflecting and denying and attacking, Mm -hmm. um, I think just pausing and taking a moment and just ask the other person, oh, what do you mean by that term privilege? I think you're going to find in most instances that the way that they're thinking about it is not as accusatory as the way that you might be interpreting and applying it. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. So it's a combination, I think, of what you're saying. I think it's a combination of that internal work of checking yourself. What is my reaction to this word? And also just asking, what what do you mean by that? What is what does that mean to you? And that is the the conversation that can flow in a positive direction. Exactly. So often yeah. in these conversations, I feel like um, people make a lot of assumptions about you know what people might mean, what they might be thinking because people are scared to to engage and just mm-hmm. even i mean it sounds so simple and yet it's also so hard as well right is to actually not try to sort of check those assumptions and actually go back to we are having a conversation here so i'm allowed to i'm allowed to ask questions about what mm-hmm. you mean with something or what you mean to contribute rather than just kind of plowing ahead with the voice that's going on in my head yeah well, as um, our listeners who are people leaders are are working to have conversations about identity, maybe for the first time on their teams, maybe they haven't done it a lot. Is there anything else that you would recommend that they keep in mind? We've talked a lot about a lot. Is there anything else that we missed that that you think is important? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the important principles that we have in the book is the very last chapter where we talk about the importance of being generous to sources of non-inclusive behavior. So we point out mm-hmm. that all of us at times are going to make mistakes in these conversations. You know, if you think about allyship as a relationship, like a triangle with an ally, the affected person, who's the sort of target of the bias, and then the source of non-inclusive behavior, who's the person who originated the bias, all of us are going to be at each of those points on the triangle from time to time, right? We can't always be in the, in the ally position or the affected person position because everyone makes mistakes. Mm-hmm. And I think once you kind of realize that, you know, everyone makes mistakes, it's not just that there is some small group of terrible people who are saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. I think that ought to lead people to be generous to each other to try to trigger that growth mindset that I was talking about earlier. Obviously, there are cases where people do deserve to be canceled if they've done extremely terrible things. So yeah. I'm excluding, you know, really egregious cases from this. But in the ordinary kind of run of the mill pace, what we want people to do is, you know, separate the behavior from the person. So focus on, you know, the action that the person did and the impact that their action might have had on someone rather than immediately kind of jumping down their throat and accusing them of being malicious in, you know, whatever it is that they did. And then also trying to approach people by showing that you're also learning, right? Nobody likes to be approached by someone they perceive as a smug do-gooder who's coming up to them and wagging their finger at them and sort of telling them about all the terrible things that they've done because it kind of creates this sense that the other person is judging them from on high. What we think is better to do is to approach someone as a peer. So say, you know, look, you know, when you said that earlier, here's, you know, the impact that I perceived or here's, here's why, you know, I didn't think that that was the best way of approaching it. I've said very similar things before. I've done very similar things before. Here's how I learned from those mistakes. I know I'm going to mess up again. If I do that, I hope you'll come to me and talk to me about, you know, what I've done. That kind of a conversation is the other person is going to be much more receptive to hearing my feedback than if I go and, you know, wag my finger at them when I'm approaching them. And Mm so from a people leader perspective, you know, you're really responsible for, creating the culture on your team and in your work group. And I think displaying to people a kind of generosity so that they don't think a mistake automatically is going to make them into a terrible person. They realize that they're allowed to own up to their mistakes and that the culture is going to actually help them learn and grow from those mistakes. I think that's a really important thing that leaders can do to set the tone on their team so that people don't feel like you know, one mistake is automatically going to get them cancelled. Yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, um, I, I agree that kind of calling people in instead of calling them out, the bringing people in, sharing that you are all on this growth journey, that that having a, a growth mindset that's embedded not just about them but also about yourself, and really sharing that vulnerability, all of that I think also reduces those feelings of shame and guilt um, that that can come from the work of that inner work of change. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Well, um, this is a, a show about 
actions. And so we learn and then we take action as allies. And and so what action would you like people to take coming take coming away from our conversation today? So a big one, I think, is to do a bit of an inventory about those behaviors that I said before about avoid, deflect, deny, and attack. So avoidance mm. is where you run away from conversations or stay silent. Deflect is where you, you know, pick a different topic to talk about. You change the subject. Deny is where you just reflexively shut people down and sort of say that they're wrong about whatever it is that they're telling you. And then attack is where you really make it personal. So you use insult, sarcasm, eye rolling, that kind of behavior. I think as a real starting point for people is to just do an honest self-examination, a self-inventory about, you know, when I have these uncomfortable conversations about identity in my life, what forms of behavior might I be engaging in that are not really the most productive ways to be engaging in these conversations? So as I mentioned, I'm definitely an avoidance guy. I'm someone who, you know, sees an awkward conversation and runs away screaming in the other direction. Um, I think Mm. a lot of people do, but, you know, we all have sort of go-to behaviors, right? And I think sort of as a starting point, identifying what is it that I might be doing unhelpfully now can then um, sort of prompt you to reflect on what you might be able to do to kind of fix that in the next conversation that you're in. Excellent. Um, So I want to give you a moment to share how people can learn more about your book and and you and your work too. Um, Where can people learn more? Right. So the book is called Say the Right Thing. Uh, You can just plug that into Google or it's really available at all major retailers. If you want to learn about our work, so uh, we're called the Meltzer Center. We have a very long name, but if you just type Meltzer, M-E-L-T-Z-E-R Center uh, into Google, you'll you'll see our work and our, on there as well on our website. And you can also follow us on uh, Twitter or LinkedIn. Fantastic. And we will share links in our show notes as well, which you can find at ally.cc. I'll also include that episode I mentioned with Nisha Anand. Um, because I think that is a, th- these these two conversations are um, go well together. So I hope you listen to that if you haven't already. And thank you. Thank you, David. I appreciate you and having this conversation. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Yeah, likewise. All right, everyone, go take action. See you next week. We'll share resources and a transcript from this discussion at ally.cc. And please make sure to subscribe to our channel and rate this show. It makes a difference for us. Thank you for being part of our community. And remember, the more we take action, the more we grow as humans and as leaders, and the more we transform our communities. So what action will you take today? Let us know your actions by emailing podcast at changecatalyst.co or reaching out on social media. And Leading with Empathy and Allyship is a show by Change Catalyst where we build inclusive innovation through training, consulting, and events. You can learn more about us at changecatalyst.co. So let's keep building allyship across our communities and around the world. Thank you for listening.